All right, greetings everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion here. We are going to be talking about uh, the Weatherford College Learning Community, or as you will hear us refer to it as the WCLC. Uh, I don't know that that's any less or more <laughs> difficult to say. WCLC versus Weatherford College Learning Community. It is something that I, Scott Williams, and Dana Brewer uh, put together and developed and have been running for the past two semesters now, from the fall through this spring. And we also have three people who have been participating in the Weatherford College Learning Communities who are going to be talking about what they have done and what has happened in the WCLC for them. We are using uh, live captioning, as you can see up here. This is a feature inside uh, Google Chrome if you are using like a Google Slides product. So just pointing that out to you, this is to try and be as ADA and UDL compliant as we possibly can be with this. It is a bit stream of consciousness, consciousness in the way that it is put up there, and it does tend to probably make some mistakes that will make you laugh at various points in time because it's an AI and it sometimes turns our words into something strange. <laughs> so just letting you know that that's coming up there. So I'm going to let each of our panelists here introduce themselves, then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brewer to start talking about the WCLC to, to start with. So okay. please just introduce um, yourself. My name is Peter Klimo. I'm the ultrasound program director here at Weatherford. I've been with the college for three years. Um, I was doing ultrasound for more than 30 years and been teaching it for 15, 18 years now um, at various colleges. I'm Shannon Mills. I'm an English professor in the Assistant Department Chair for Humanities. I have been here going on my 19th year, so quite a while. Yeah. One captioning is doing lovely things with this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my name is Veronica Levery. I'm a student here at Weatherford College. Uh, I have been here for, this is going to be my second full semester, um, and I am representing the student population. Okay, and I'm Dr. Brewer, and I teach um, English, but also I'm currently serving as the department chair for humanities. And as Instructor Williams mentioned, um, I certainly was, we worked together on putting this group together, writing a proposal, getting all of the um, people <laughs> situated, reserving rooms, and all of that. It's kind of funny because we were both kind of independently working on the same thing, and then one day ended up talking to each other, and we were like, oh, we're actually have the same idea. So we went in and talked to VP Envy, and here we are. So primarily what we do is we meet uh, every month to talk about different issues, <coughs> pedagogical issues. So for instance, Instructor Williams mentioned UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning. So that isn't just things like um, captioning, although it does include captioning. Uh, it's different ways to make sure that the material that you're presenting reaches uh, a wide audience, essentially. And part of what we do, of course, is read all these books, yes, and then we talk about them, not just the books, but how we apply them in the classroom. So that's kind of what all of these things say. You see here, number two, link pedagogy in the classroom with institutional issues and student success, and so on and so forth. Um, ultimately, the goal is to conduct inquiry focused on student learning that is grounded in context, so that we have some theory and some research uh, that we're discussing as we try to improve our courses and our student successes. And again, this is basically what we do. I mentioned the meetings. We are expanding the professional development section of the library. You are always welcome to read any of these books. Most of us still have a copy. If you happen to be in one of our classes, we could even give it to you to look at for sure. And then this last point is really important, which is expanding the conversation between faculty, staff, staff and students regarding effective classroom practices. And that is why we do have students as part of the WCLC. We actually have two students. Um, of course, not everybody who's on the WCLC could be on the panel today. So something to think about as we move forward is that we are definitely always interested in having students who would like to read, who you know want to learn a little bit more about, if you're an education major, for instance, it's a great group, I think, to join. And I know that you'll talk a little bit more about the student experience in a bit, I believe. We do have, uh, I want to go ahead and give you our reading list. This is our first, as it started in the fall, going through the spring. 
We have, have four books, three of which we have read to this point in time. The fourth one is our March book. So we had one in November, one in January, one in February, and one in March. And that is essentially what will close out our first academic year of it. I have all the books up here at the front for anybody who may want to look at them later in the session. They are all also, as uh, Dr. Brewer said, we all have copies of them. And there are multiple copies of these in the library in the professional development section because we did actually buy extra copies for the library to have. So we got the Small Teaching, Everyday Lessons from the Science of Learning by James M. Lang. Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone. Universal Design for Learning in Higher Education by Thomas Tobin and Kristen, Kirsten Bailing. Follow up to Small Teaching, Small Teaching Online, Applying Learning Science in Online Classes by Flower Darby and James M. Lang. And finally, the book that we'll be reading next month, uh, Bandwidth Recovery, Helping Students Reclaim Cognitive Resources Lost to Poverty, Racism, and Social Marginalization by no, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> you, you can see up there, I don't have any clue how to pronounce that, but we will go from there. So what the primary pur purpose of this session is not for Dr. Brewer and I to talk about it, but actually for the people who have been participating in it to talk about it. And we, and said it, as Dr. Brewer said, we invited three people in to talk about their experiences. The first one who's going to talk is going to be Dr. Peter Klimo. He's a professor of diagnostic medical sonography and the Di diagnostic medical sonography program director. Oh, there we go. <laughs> that was hard to get all that stuff out. Um, he would also, if you did not see this on the side here, he would like you to, if you get a chance, you can do it either on a computer, on a phone, or something like that. If you can log into srs.campuslabs.com with the ID 35105. He's going to have some polling questions. I would actually questions. ask you to please do that. Log on with your phone before we move forward. We don't give me time to pay back there. No, it's more of we didn't sign you in to do that. <laughs> that might help. Yes, give me just a second. We're going to sign him in so we can actually, he can do that on this end so we can show the things. While they're doing that, one thing I will say that I meant to say earlier that I, I should have said and I didn't is that um, I realize all of you are reading an awful lot and doing an awful lot of studying already. So the thought of reading another book is probably like, really? Is she serious? But one of the great things about spending some time reading books about Teaching is that an awful, it usually um, allows you to learn about how you learn too, which is really important because as you, once you can identify the, how you retain information, it makes it easier to figure out what you need to do if you're missing something. So for instance, have you ever uh, tried to make, I don't know, anything really, put together an Ikea table, bake a cake or something, you miss a step along the way, you probably don't miss that step the next time, right? Especially if it completely ruins the cake and it doesn't taste the way it's supposed to. Yes? So that's kind of the same thing, right? So that's one reason that it's kind of useful, if you can, to you know learn a little bit about the way that you learn. Okay, we are almost there. Um, there we go. <laughs> first, I want to tell you why I joined the uh, learning community. Um, most of the college instructors, not just here, but everywhere, they got to teaching because they love their field and they are good at what they do. Uh, it doesn't matter what uh, area you are talking about. So we, as instructors, we seldom got any kind of formal instruction into teaching methods, dealing with the class, dealing with the uh, psyche of the class and all the things that go on in there. So I wanted to learn about how to become a better instructor. And uh, along the way, we have uh, come across this book, and that's the book that I would like to talk about a little bit, and not uh, the specifics. Every book that we have read so far have um, many very useful ideas how to become a better instructor. But this particular book really resonated with me because I'm very sensitive to fairness. I know everybody says, and it's true, life is not fair, but we should be fair in our interactions, and, um, whatever we do, teaching or not. And this book 
said a couple of things that were um, really interesting, and I will um, kind of read a couple of um, passages from the book I left it here. <coughs> In ultrasound, we teach basically the didactic part, uh, which is the book knowledge. You have to pass exams, otherwise you don't become a sonographer, or you don't, you don't become a registered sonographer, and then you don't get a job. And then we teach scanning skills in the lab, and of course the students go to clinical and they uh, learn more about the, the real field there. <coughs> For me, personally, it's a very difficult emotional thing when we lose a student and it did happen the last semester. And keep in mind that our selection process is very rigorous. We have a lot of screening methods, we have an interview process, so the students that we get um, are really not high school students. Um, so they are more prepared, many of them have associate degrees and they come to the ultrasound program and they are more prepared to learn at a college. Um, so when we lose a student, I really feel bad about it. And the simple reason is because, and that's according to my wife, and she's the authority, she says I am selfish, self-centered, and stubborn. <laughs> and because I am selfish and self-centered, I like to feel good about myself. And the only time I good about myself in my profession, if the students are successful. So when we lose one, it's really painful for me. I, I cannot tell you how much it bothers me. And this particular event, <coughs> what happened was the student probably didn't study enough. <coughs> and even that, I feel somehow it's my fault because I could not reach that student, could not motivate that student to study more, or I couldn't discover in time how to assist her uh, about you know how to improve the study skills. So any kind of student loss is uh, really my fault. And then where this book comes in is uh, it kind of says that if we don't try to reach everybody, then we are discriminating. We'll get to it. I would like you to go through four questions here. And just let me know when you're ready. Just uh, yes, first one. Let's start okay. with the questions. You are all logged in, or as many of you as you as wanted, right? Three five one zero five SRS dot campus labs dot com. And then you click on the first, and then when you hit start, it should yep. wait not until it there you go. Start. Yep. Okay. First question is: Have you got the flu shot this season, fall, winter, or recently? So, just answer yes or no, and it will auto. Um, update up there as people answer. It's fun to watch. Yes, please do. It's, it's a good game. Yes, <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to get the flu shot? And your answers are not to get the flu or all other reasons, including that you didn't get it. Okay, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> all other reasons. Okay, question three, not about the flu shot. When customers walk into a car dealership, which of the following do you think is their main reason? Want to buy a car, have service for their car, just looking, or have nothing better to do? Can you start this? Yeah, yeah it started, this. yes. Oh, indeed. Yeah, I hit start before I start reading it. Good. Yes, one more. Last question. 
Do you believe that change, mostly, makes a product better? Yes, no, or the good old maybe? <laughs> not just ultrasound. And in medicine, any field of medicine, uh, it's prevention that really is the most important thing because it's the least expensive and the best for the patients. So when I ask you about the flu shot, it's a pre prevention thing. And then this book is about how to implement the universal design in learning concept, strategy, and steps so we could include everybody. And the prevention part is that we want to prevent students to become frustrated, get turned off, and leave us. We want them to proceed and succeed in the field. So that's a prevention part. And the car dealership is, <coughs> I keep my bottle with me. The car dealership question, no, it's oh, this one. Okay. <laughs> is about anybody who comes to the college, they come here because they want to learn, right? So. If I am not reaching you as an instructor, then I fail you. So in a car dealership, if they don't sell you a car, they fail to sell you a car. But if I don't reach you, I fail you to give you what you came here for, learning. <clears throat> and then I do believe, I'm not so much skeptical, a little bit, that change usually makes a product or a service better. Uh, our product is teaching and it is better if we employ the universal design. So let me try to read you a couple of things from here. Just, I have two more minutes, right? Sure, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so what is universal design? And it's about the Higher Education Opportunity Act. The definition is that universal design for learning means a scientifically valid framework for guiding educational practice that provides flexibility in the ways information is presented, in the ways students respond or demonstrate knowledge and skills, and in the ways students are engaged. And also it goes on saying to remove barriers and um, uh, try to provide these services equally to everybody. And I want to read you just a few more things. Um, it's also the law that we have to uh, kind of implement the universal design and learning strategies. And the Office of Civil Rights had uh, uh, quite a few statements regarding uh, this, and it's kind of mandatory to provide this. And there are three aspects that I want to tell you that are kind of unusual or work. First of all, waiting for accommodation request is no longer enough. What we have done 15 years ago is we waited for somebody to say that I have this, that, or the other disability, and I would like to find special accommodations. That's not the case anymore. Uh, any universities, colleges, they have to kind of go ahead of that request and provide everything in a way that everybody can reach it. And second, and this is my main thing from this book, because I would probably read it twice. So it's just one sentence. Offering unequal access is discrimination. Offering unequal access is discrimination. It really hit me. So if I am not offering all of our services in a way that anybody, whether they request special accommodations or not, they can reach that kind of information that I'm discriminating against them. Uh, and the third is that Providing equal access, but too late, is also discrimination. And there was a lawsuit at the university where uh, some uh, visually impaired students would complain that at the football games they couldn't see uh, well the whatever was displayed on their on those big monitors. So eventually they find a way to have them access to that information. But the law says that 
the college or university, if the college or university cannot provide equal access in a timely fashion, meaning at the same time that other learners have access to the same information, that is also discrimination. So what we try to do here at Weather for College to kind of redesign all of our lectures and uh, communications and all other aspects of the activities to be UBL compliant. Thank you. I talk too much, I guess. <laughs> Next is Dr. Shannon Bales, Professor of English and Assistant Department Chair for Humanities. Would you like the clicker to move your stuff forward or you want me to react? Because you know what point you're moving from one thing to the next. Yeah. Okay, so the way this is organized, it'll show you a slide that takes the relevant quote from the book and lets you know the book. I'll give you a minute to read over it and see if anyone has questions. That unlike Peter, who was doing the broad overview, because his was the broad overview, I wanted to talk about how I'm trying to implement some of these things in the classroom in the real hope that it's going to translate into benefit for you guys, that the students will reap some sort of benefit from it. So we'll start with small teaching. I'll give you a moment to read the slide, and then we'll go forward. steps or we think we do those three steps but we might do them simultaneously or we might not do them in a really systematic approach which is kind of what I've done in the past with the writing projects that we do in my English composition classes but this time I thought I'm going to do it in a really systematic manner the way that the small teaching book suggests so I identify what the cognitive tasks are and that's a real fancy way of saying giving students a chance to learn the skills that need to go into long-term memory so that when they write the paper, they can retrieve those skills and do a good job on the paper. So these are the cognitive tasks, like knowing what kind of title fits with the paper, knowing how to really grab a real reader, um, not just your instructor, being able to have a thesis that's appropriate, and all these other things. And then I had to ask myself, which one of these, or how many of them, might students already know. So we don't want to spend important class time in English 1302, which is at least a second semester class, going over. And so I thought these are the ones that they should already have a firm grasp on. And just in case MLA layout and documentation is not something they know, I have videos, tutorial videos, posted in the classroom that students can go refresh their memories on. And then I point them to a text-based resource that's online and point them to the pages in the handbook, which is a concept from the Reach Everyone book. That's UDL, giving multiple pathways to learn the same information. Some people like learning via those videos, and some people like, no, give me a little checklist. So and other people are like, give me a conversation in text. So we have all of those. So this leaves another kind of list that I think we have to do this in class. So which ones of these skills need direct instruction and which can have indirect instruction? For my class, direct instruction, we first practice indirectly, looking at what other people have written and seeing what is appropriate or inappropriate, what works well for the genre, what doesn't. Indirect instruction comes through mock peer reviews, where you read prior student papers and you start talking about what's really good in them, what you should model, and what's an area that needs improvement. So the direct instruction, those activities are in red. And we spent a lot of time in class sequencing and building, um, especially for this project, for their analyzing a visual image, like a painting or a photograph. We did a lot of scaffolding for that, but it was all really in-class practice. And then the students had to write their own. And in the same day, like they do it in class, and before the end of that day, they get feedback on what they've written. So we worked in stages on the project. Everything in white was indirect instruction through the mock peer review. 
they would look at what other students had written and talk about strengths and weaknesses and they'd try to tie it back to these skills. But they didn't actually practice that in the class. Now when I grade with the rubric, all these things are on the rubric, I can tell at the end where I think the instruction did not do a good job for the students because I can tell which ones of the criteria are lower than the others in terms if you're getting a low score consistently on that particular criterion. But I was curious if that aligned with how the students felt about their own learning process. And because of these books that we're reading, I set up a survey. It was just an anonymous feedback survey. And when I pulled them, 75% of the students, without talking to each other, it was just spur the moment, here's your survey at the start of class, fill this out online in Canvas. 75% wanted more help, direct instruction, on how to get the language of the toolkits from our textbook into their essays. And 60%, in some way, noted that they wanted help with paragraphs, especially transitions between paragraphs. And that's exactly what my tracking in the rubric score showed. So they were exactly in alignment with what I felt we didn't do a good job on in class. So now in the second project, which is the creeper explosion. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, you will definitely see things that will make you laugh if you read along. It does not like my OP accent. Yes. Okay, so where was I? Creeper explosion. The second <laughs> I'm thinking Minecraft. Um, the second project is <laughs> using the same skills that the first project did. So now we've got built-in direct practice on these. And the students and myself, we were kind of good at pointing out the paragraph transitions needed work. They really did. And it was interesting watching people try to create really strong transitions between paragraphs when they hadn't really consciously thought of it. And so they kind of feel more confident now, I hope. It turns out really well for the project. They haven't turned in the last draft yet for a grade. But I was just really surprised and excited that what I'm seeing when I do this is exactly what the students are seeing. So we can be more of a team and help hopefully more people succeed at the projects. And overall, the grades were higher this semester than they have been in past semesters by a significant percentage. It's a statistically important uh, number. So this is really exciting to me. It all has stemmed from this WCLC committee. But questions about that? <laughs> Chris is getting pregnant. <laughs> 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 Why am I saying pregnant? <laughs> okay. Did you guys glad you came to this? <laughs> projects, at least for our area, we have a sense of scaffolding and trying to build those skills that you need to score a strong grade at the end. Hopefully your instructors are very transparent in how they're grading and what they're doing in class and how it connects to the actual rubric that's being graded.
which once I read that made sense. My kiddo is dyslexic. He will not declare himself as such unless he begins to fail greatly in all of his classes. He's only 13, but he's even now asking, do I have to declare myself when I go into high school? So he's leaving eighth grade and he, he wants right now not to have those accommodations. He won't be very successful though if his teachers aren't using this, provide a different pathway for all the learners. The thing about Peach Point is that you look at an assignment or a skill that you're trying to teach, and if you're constantly, as an instructor, each semester, that's where you start seeing students struggle, or that's where you start getting a lot of those question forum posts, or the private inbox messages, this just isn't clicking with me, I don't understand this part, or what does that mean, or can you help me here? You track those, those are pinch points, which means that it's where the flow of information is bogging down, that something is occurring. So in my English 23 and 27 and 23, 28, I have an essay that is called an evaluative scholarly debate critique, which is a mouthful. But basically, you find a primary source, something like Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown. You go do research on the secondary sources in our databases. You find at least two scholars who are arguing different interpretations for that primary source. And you're <coughs> working not with the primary source, but explaining the debate, evaluating the debate, and then saying which side of the debate did a better job at analyzing the primary source. There are a lot of skills in that. And because the standard project in a lot of sophomore lit courses tends to be a regular literary analysis paper, they're starting with this concept of I'm doing a literary analysis paper, and then it's all about, nope, tell me about the scholarly sources and what they're saying. There's a disconnect there. It's kind of hard sometimes to shift that mindset. So each semester, they've only been doing this, this is the start of the third semester, I'll have people wanting help finding a primary source that actually lends itself really well to a scholarly debate. Because some of the stories and poems we read, most of the scholars are in agreement. But some of them have widely different interpretations out there amongst the scholars. So that's one pinch point. The next one, I always get questions about how do I use the databases, even though I've linked to the library's tutorials, which are great, but they're using more general keywords, and so I had at least one student who had this really strange paper on government and abortion, and nothing about primary or secondary literary sources, because the tutorial led them to believe those were the exact same keywords they had to use for the class. The other would be um, this final one, what's the difference between this and literary analysis? Because some people have a really hard time making the jump. <coughs> so what I do to address the pinch points. It, on this, yeah. yeah. So with the first one, about the, which kinds of primary sources lend itself to debate. I went back and in as many lectures as I could because we just read this this semester. I started putting in discussion of notice that one side of the debate is interpreting it this way and another side of the debate is interpreting it this way. To really point back to the lecture, to use those keywords that will let people know this is a good primary source to use for that project. And so that's been added in, I don't know how well that's going to go, because again, I'm only doing it this semester, I don't have the results yet. For how to use the database, when we get to the project, they're going to have the link to the library's tutorial if they want it, but I'm also going to do a screencast video that walks through how to do so on a primary source from our own reading list. And so hopefully we'll be more relevant and clear up that confusion. That student is not the only one that's the only one who didn't say, that seems weird for a lit class. I'm going to contact Dr. Bales and ask her about this. Mm -hmm. And so that person didn't see the announcement either. So unfortunately, that matters because it's a 25% of your class grade. That's two and a half letter grades. And so that oops mattered greatly to that student's overall class grade. That bothers me. So it shouldn't happen that way. 
The difference between this assignment and a standard literary analysis, I redid the instructions to try to make that very clear. And they'll also be, because of UDL, they'll be able to access, access all this information as screencast videos, as written text. I'll put up a file and walk them through how to use the open word so that it will read the instructions like a podcast. The computer will read it for you. If you want to be, you know, in your car, hopefully not trying to read it to you, but start it and then listen to it. If you're doing things at home and you want to listen to it like a podcast, it is not my voice that the computer apparently cannot capture correctly. It's a standard American accent computer voice. And then if I can make it work, narrated PowerPoint slides to try to condense the information but still hit all the important points. And hopefully, and I'll check that and see if things get better. I'll know things get better if there are fewer questions and inbox messages and the grades are the same or hopefully even better than what they were before those changes. And so hopefully that works. But any questions? That's pretty much all I have about how I'm actually trying to take these concepts and use them in the class in the hopes it gets better for students. And the first one is a success, and the second one I won't know until the end of the semester, though. Other questions? So hopefully you can see, too, that we, those of us who care, and that's the majority of the instructors here, we put a lot of thought on how to reach you guys and keep from repeating kind of the same pitfalls in our projects and our teaching and what we're doing. And if anything else, because it's majority students in here, reach out to your instructors. I don't know why that one student was probably so confused, but never reached out. And there's so many ways to contact us. So that's kind of my last pitch for developing the relationship. I'm actually gonna follow up just very, very quickly what she said, because this is a funny story that I tell in my face-to-face -face classes that follows up exactly what she was just talking about. The second summer I ever taught here, which was back in summer of 2008, I submitted essentially course evaluations for the students that were that my own, not the ones that have come officially through the college, and had them give any sort of feedback that they may want on that. And one of the students said, the professor does not help us with questions that we do not ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like a ridiculous thing to say because how would I know, you know, would do, so on what she was saying, we don't know there's a problem if you don't tell us there's a problem. We don't know that there's a question that needs to be answered if you don't tell us. And that's what I've taken from that. Now, it may not have been the most eloquently explained as to what that student meant, but I have used that and taken it to heart really a lot since then. So I just wanted to feed off of that. I, I never would have thought that watching that tutorial would cause someone to go so far off track. But when I went back and watched it from the perspective of someone who's never done literary research, I was like, they're trying to follow exactly what that tutorial said. And unfortunately, that didn't work. So I need something that's specific to our literary research instead. So I'll put that together. All right. Well, hello, guys. Uh, I'm a student just like y'all. And I wanted to give the students perspective. So what are we as students looking for? Um, I am pursuing nursing here, and this is, like I said, my second semester. So what are we as students looking for in the classroom? Well, I, I believe, at least from my perspective, we want to be engaged in the classroom, right? You don't want to sit through a boring lecture. You want to be engaged. Students come from all walks of life, and some students need more help than others. Some of us just graduated high school. Some of us haven't been to school in over 10 years. So we come from all, we're, come from all age groups. If we try a different approach to learning, we may be able to reach more students in different ways. So just like both of them said, both of them have their own ways of teaching us students. Some ways work better than others. So we have to also see what, how we learn as students and try to better the way that we learn. And there's a lot of things going on here on campus that can uh, that you guys can utilize on what works best for you. So one of the ways that we can better engage our students, um, one approach is the plus one approach, also in the reach everyone, teach everyone. 
um, and use what is working and let go of what is not. So what, on chapter five, it talked about um, a professor in class um, using the same method over and over again. And it, it encouraged professors to take what is working in your classroom, see how students are engaging, and if something um, that students are really struggling with, let go of it and try something else. Do y'all agree? Yes. yes. So, um, I really like that because uh, I have a professor here on campus that some ways may not work for some students and other ways do. Some students prefer not to write a lot. So this professor uh, will allow us to uh, record our 350 page written assignment of the week and turn that in. And so one way may not work for that student and that it may keep that student away from turning in that written assignment. But if, he's, if he or she is able to record it, they're probably gonna turn it in. Okay, so as a student I thrive uh, on having different methods of turning it in. Uh, for instance, in our speech class, I did an online class where we could give our speech by either recording it uh, at home and have an audience of 10, or the speech professor gave us another option. For those students that were comfortable speaking in front of class, we were able to just walk into uh, one of her lectures and be able to present it uh, to the class um, that way. So not only did she give us one way, but she gave us two. So some students may have been comfortable with just you know recording it at home um, and doing it that way, but some of us are okay with actually walking in and, and you you know you have models and you can present it like that. So um, having you know different ways of turning in assignments is uh, can be very beneficial to some of us. Um, in our government, like I mentioned, in our government class, our weekly dis discussions have to be 350 words. And so this particular professor actually didn't know at the time that um, if you hit the record button on the weekly discussion, you could record it. And because one of the students did that, now he allows it in his classroom, which I think is great. So um, I want to use our uh, biology professor, um, and he's in, the, in here right now, Dr. Twanabasu. Um, Look up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, anatomy is a pretty, pretty difficult course. And uh, it's like speaking a new language. And one thing that I love that he did, he said, uh, in class, I can tell if a student is understanding the material by how they react. If they nod, it probably means that they understand. And if it doesn't, if they don't nod, then I try to teach it a different way. So um, I really love that you did that, and he's using the UDL. He's, he, he gets that students ju can't just read off of PowerPoint and understand. You have to explain it a different way. And what he did, he used baking a cake to explain the process of cellular respiration. Um, was it cellular respiration? Gene, gene expression. Yes, gene expression. So um, in that way, at that time, I was able to understand it a lot better. Um, and I love that he did that. So go Dr. Tawanabasu. <laughs> um, so likewise, some professors use different approaches and some others don't. So I encourage y'all as students to go to your professor's office hours. Ask for help. Because if they don't know, like they mentioned, how can they help us? If you are struggling in math and you don't want to go to that professor, there's the academic um, center. Reach out to one of those because they might be able to help you and you might be able to understand. So obviously, we're here to learn, right? We want to learn. That's why we came to college. We want to do something with our lives. And so utilize the resources that are on campus. And I'm so thankful to y'all um, that be, because before I was part of this panel, I had no idea what goes on into teaching. I didn't realize that there's so much work that they do that's behind the scenes that we don't know about. They come in with a blank slate with a file a folder, a file, and then pick things out that work or don't work. So another example, my uh, math professor, 
he provides uh, you know, notes. And he doesn't have to provide notes, but he does, because he wants us to succeed. So because I've been part of this panel, I have been so appreciative of my professors that are doing a good job. So go Dr. Tonabasu and go English and um, math professors. But if you don't have professors that are doing those things for y'all, reach out to them. Because they may not know that it's not working for y'all. How would they know if you don't speak up? So, anyway, that's the end of my presentation. Just to close out, let me give you the last couple of things here. I did want to acknowledge the people who have been attending the Weatherford College Learning Community. Uh, this is, we've had uh, professors and students and staff from across the campus who have participated at one time or another in it. I also will put in a plug right now. We are going to have a similar thing to this, but a little bit uh, broader sense with the entire panel there. Uh, the WCLC Academic Year Summary Campus-Wide Discussion on Tuesday, April 28th from 1 to 2 p.m. here. In this room. <laughs> in this room. We will have read the fourth book by that point in time, and we will be asking other of the participants in the panel, to, uh, the uh, WCLC, to talk about their experiences and get some reflections on it. Just briefly, part of our charge that I forgot to say in the beginning, it was on one of the bullet points, is that we are supposed to take this information and spread it around, which is part of what we're doing here. So that's the other reason for um, that event on the 28th. We are required and expected to share information, which of course why wouldn't we because it's good information. Okay. And then our plans beyond this, as I said from the beginning, this is our first year doing this. So second year and beyond. The first four are really the second year. We will continue obviously to hold discussions. Uh, we are looking to recruit new members and faculty, staff, students, anybody else who is interested. Uh, we are looking to present at a variety of conferences, such as we are doing here, but also looking at conferences outside of Weatherford College. And we would like to, if we get enough people, currently we have one discussion a month. We'd like to add it to enough people where you can have two different groups or more discussing a book each month if we can get enough people so that we can just have more and more people involved in this process. Beyond that, we would like to eventually um, get a, essentially, I don't know if you would call it a pedagogical group or a professional development group or something like that, a canvas group for the institution that everybody could be involved in for the use of spreading out ideas and resources. And we would also like to invite some speakers, maybe some of the people who wrote the books that we have been reading or others to come and talk either to the campus in general or to faculty and staff at in-service or anything like that. Those are our kind of longer term goals. If you're interested at all, again, this is Dr. Jane Brewer. I'm Scott Williams. You're welcome to reach out to us. And we have, wow, two minutes. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Yeah. But definitely if you're at all interested, or if you know somebody who you think may be interested um, in joining to read uh, as a student, please, please reach out to one of us, especially education majors, um, but anybody really. And I, I really think that nursing and, and health, anything in the health field, um, there's a lot of education involved, and certainly if nothing else, at least being able to communicate with people in a fair manner, which comes all down to education. So if you want to share with one of your friends, we really appreciate it. All right. well, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to meet you.